Well, that was a pretty interesting FP1 and FP2. Uh, not what we expected from the weather, but uh, as my last video, video stated, we can see a lot of changes in the weather in Singapore. Low pressure system stalling out and then not us, us getting what we thought we would get. Uh, but pretty dry sessions in FP1 and FP2. Uh, but before we get too far into it, subscribe if you're new, throw me a like if you got a second, and let's get going. So, uh, FP1 session, very weird. Usually in FP1, you'll see a lot of car setup. You'll see a lot of, especially when we go from such a low downforce circuit as Baku to a very short turnaround to Singapore, a very high downforce uh, circuit, and the speed differences and straights, and it's a very tight circuit, whereas Baku is pretty open for that 2.2 kilometer run that's there. Uh, you usually see FP1 be riddled with Flovis paint and aero rakes and stuff like that to try to figure out uh, how some of the upgrades that they've each car has brought works with the car on this type of circuit. Singapore is also very weird that is humid, it's at night, it's very hot, uh, stagnant, uh, usually quite windy, dirty, all that kind of stuff, but we saw 30 minutes in red tire quali runs, uh, which I think was partial uh, due to weather. Uh, there was a little bit of rain coming in in between FP1 and FP2 sessions. Not really rain, but threat of rain coming in. Uh, a system that was supposed to come in for FP2 stalled out on the first main island of, uh, of Singapore. If you know Singapore, it's a main strait of transportation uh, of ships and stuff that go right in through the little gap. There's a main island at the top, main island on the bottom, and the weather comes in from the west side of everything so it, it comes across and it can sometimes if it misses the little uh channel way in between the two islands and it hits the uh, that first island first the weather will stall out which is why we the weather in singapore is just kind of all over the place so we saw that that stalled out and the threat of rain for fb2 which is why i believe they were trying to get their fp1 quality runs done uh, because fb2 might have been uh compromised uh, didn't end up happening. We got dry all the whole way through. Although, still very interesting, uh, there was a lot of push laps on both sessions. Uh, tons of people hitting the walls. We saw Charles Leclerc, Albon, Norris, Piastri. We saw Alonso have a crazy moment, which I have a little video on later. And then we saw Russell at the very end of FP2 actually coming straight into the wall. But this is FP1, uh, pretty standard stuff. We saw the Ferraris, Max is up there. The RBs seem really good uh, this weekend. I thought maybe Yuki and Daniel being up there in the top 10 was outside of what we would normally see, but they did it again in FP2, which we'll get into. And then the the Williams actually quite strong on both single lap paces and on long runs as well, doing quite well. Uh, super impressed by Franco Colapinto. There was a point in time where people were putting uh, medium tire laps in an FP2, and he actually did the same time on a hard. I don't know that we'll see hard tires this weekend. I would like to see the Pirelli strategy uh, set up there what we think is going to happen. The amount of long distance runs on soft tires really surprised me. We saw, I want to say like nine tenths of the teams out there. I only really saw kind of one, the Saubers not doing super long runs on softs. Everybody else was handily on softs. I was surprised on how slow the Haas were as well. So let's start going through FB2 session. So we saw Norris and Leclerc on the soft tires doing ridiculous 30s and then everybody else in the field not be able to break 31. I thought that was very telling by how hard Norris and Leclerc were pushing. It is really hard to put a lap together at Singapore. It is incredibly hard, especially the third sector. We saw several times people pushing through on purple and green laps, green sectors, and then in the last sector, messing it up, especially the Ferraris. They were having a very hard time uh, turning the tires on, or at least keeping the tires long enough to uh, push through to the third sector, especially Carlos Sainz. Uh, he had three runs, I think I counted, where he lost out in the third sector on his push laps. So uh, really coming down to the last sector there, it's very interesting to see how many laps everybody got done. So the top six or seven or whatever, all doing the same amount of laps. And everybody doing like pretty representative amount of laps too across the board. Considering how small of a track it is, although I guess it isn't that small uh, when you think about it, it is five kilometers or so. Um, but uh, when you think of how tight the track is, 
the time's quite spread out. Although that distance from third to, uh, let's say, geez, 13th? Not that far off, because they're really only five tenths. Norris and Leclerc, who were both able to hook up laps on soft tires. And that goes to show you, everybody was trying to do that, and really only two out of 20 were able to really hook up those laps. Uh, again, I'll note, I'll note Yuki Sonoda and Daniel Ricciardo very quick. For some reason, they do have a new rear wing. It was one of the only ones that I saw Flova's paint on. So let's get into controversy. I know, my favorite thing. I really just kind of like to talk about results and racing, but let's go into controversy. So this is the um, thing with Max. He has been told many times in the past, and all the drivers have, uh, Yuki Sonona is another one, uh, that misconduct is the way they say here, and, and uh, offensive language is the kind of issue. But Max was told that and then immediately went out of the press conference and threw an F-bomb down. So they actually pulled him in, him specifically, not usually it's like a blanket thing. So if Max or Yuki or anybody says anything, uh, I think Lance has done it before. If anybody says anything on the radio or it happens more than once, um, they just make a blanket kind of thing that we really would hope that this level of sportsmanship you wouldn't use that kind of language especially over the radio that everybody can hear and Max basically told them all to F off <laughs> and I don't necessarily disagree with them we see coarse language from pretty much every sporting event across the world there's people who just have potty mouths um, necessarily swear that much we're in their faces more than anybody else the only other sport that I could think of where they're more in people's faces is football uh, because they have those cool shotgun microphones. You'll see them, they're probably about, I don't know, a couple feet long. They're really, really, really good at picking up sounds and they use them to get the crunching sounds that you have from the gear and stuff like that uh, during events like that. And usually they will pick up things that maybe they don't necessarily want to. But we get radio. We get radio. They post radio. To be honest, and I will say this pretty blatantly, it's the race director's job to post that stuff. Like, uh, I can understand because we have many different ways. Sky does it. There's uh, F1.com does it if you get the direct feed from them, where you can go and listen to everybody's radio. You can just go straight up. The public can go in and listen to anybody's radio. Now, what they post on those radios is filtered, and then what gets to the live feed is also filtered. So if they didn't want to have that, they didn't have to. You know what? Most people, I want to say like 90%, aren't watching main cameras for different drivers. They're listening to the world feed, which is totally in their control. So if you don't want to hear Max get bleeped, well, guess what? Uh, don't put it up there. It's totally under control. I understand that they want the drivers to be the correct way when it is over the radio and in their sporting code that they have, uh, but just don't put it up on the live feed and you'll completely negate anything that Max or anybody else is saying. So just don't put them up there. You don't want to listen. If you didn't have Max or Yuki's radio, I'm pretty sure you would have like 90% of the swearing over radio cut down. So. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like a problem they created and want everybody to follow by. But that's just my two cents. Next thing, we have the Flexi Wing, which I mentioned uh, in the preview that it was a thing going forward. Now, obviously, that Baku Wing isn't here. That is a low downforce wing that they use for really big tracks uh, to help them go fast. So it's not really in contention this weekend, but it's still lots of talking point. Um, there's several things that happen. So the FIA says the McLaren wing is legal after the Red Bull inquiry. And then we got Toby come on a successful Red Bull complaint with the FAA. The McLaren has to modify its low down force wing. And then now I don't normally go to uh, Reddit or at least post anything on here, but uh, we had a post up here and it was, uh, man, I don't know how to say his name, but it doesn't really matter. He's a Landon Norris fan, so like him. Uh, but the bolded section here I thought was a really good representation. I don't know if this is necessary. I think it's probably a quote. Uh, but the McLaren stumbled across the rule that the gap between the main blade and the flap, the slot gap, must be the same size at all times when the DRS is closed, which is obviously not the case. Ferrari could also have a problem here. The slot gap increases at a certain point and is above certain speeds. Mer Mer McLaren therefore does not have to throw away the entire wing. It is sufficient just to stiffen up that flap. So this is not like we saw in previous years when the Red Bull, I had the video uh, last time, where under load the whole wing was coming down by probably about like that much, like half a wing 
uh, further down than what it should. It's not the whole plane of the wing that's the issue. And in that case, they gave Red Bull a certain amount of time to be able to fix that because it was integral to the whole wing. It wasn't like they could, uh, the, the detection that the FIA had changed and therefore they had to give everybody a little bit of time to be able to work their way out of that. This isn't the case here. So the whole wing isn't illegal. Just the floppiness of the slop gap thing. It could easily just put three or four more layers of um, pre-preg onto that uh, layout procedure, stiffen up the wing and you're done. If you don't know how they make these things, it's usually, I've done carbon fiber molding myself in the past, and it's a pre-impregnated material of carbon fiber that has resin embedded in it, and you lay different layers down, and that's and you build up that, and that's where you get your strength from. So uh, all they'd have to do is just re-engineer that. It actually wouldn't take that long to do, just uh, uh, some slight increase. And I'm pretty sure they would already have a previous wing that would probably meet this uh, floppiness uh, amount there. So that's pretty interesting. And then this was also up from Chris Medlin afterwards. Uh, whilst Baku rear wing complies with the regulations, and it does because the load tests they do are not necessarily at speed, they just do a upwards load test for flexing, and if it passes, it's fine. But it's really hard to tell how much downforce you're going to have and how much wind speed you're to flex the wings. So it's a really hard test to do at static. Um, and it passed all FIA deflection tests. McLaren have proactively offered to make some minor adjustments to the wing following our conversations with the FIA. Uh, in the second part, we would also expect the FIA to have similar conversations in other teams in relation to their compliance of the rear wings. So it was technically illegal, but because at the time, all the tests that they had to do on it, it passed, it's not like they can disqualify them. And they can't, in, in previous races, you would see a disqualification there because the test that the low test would have failed, therefore a disqualification. If you were to take the test right now, and still there is no test to make it illegal, um, all the tests have passed. So it is not an illegal wing. The FIA just feels it is uh, against some of the rules that they have implied for flexi wings, uh, but the tests that they have employed to do that did not catch it. Um, and so basically what this is, is, is the FIA coming forward and going to McLaren and say, we've noticed this, it looks bad, would you please stop doing that? And then going to all the other teams and told them that they've asked them to do that and then asked all the other teams to kind of follow suit more of a rule of thumb rather than anything written down. They will 100% lock this down for next year, so it doesn't happen, but I don't think they want to make a technical directive this late in the year. And I mentioned that in the preview as well. Technical directives this late in the year is not really something that we see. It's usually something that happens. Uh, it, it would be very, very similar to the DAS. If you remember DAS from previous years, uh, the Mercedes, they uh, they had a system where you could adjust the toe of the of the front wheels by pulling in and out on the on the wheel, which is technically illegal. You're not really allowed to make that kind of adjustment. But it said in the rules that all you can't say that doing something with the wheel can't affect your front wheels because the teams couldn't turn the cars then. So they took that rule and bent it as far as it could possibly go. Well, we took our wheel and we made our front wheels do something. And that's how they got around that rule. And they politely asked um, uh, Merck to stop doing it. And I mean, they still had the DAS, but it turned out it really wasn't that effective anyway. It was only to warm tires, not necessarily to do anything of going faster. But that would be the similar kind of thing. They didn't really break any rules. It was clearly illegal in the spirit of the sport or whatever you want to call it. But uh, I think this falls under that kind of category. Okay, let's get away from controversy. It's not necessarily my favorite thing. And let us go into the Singapore. I don't really follow the FIA, but I do, uh, I do now, uh, and they have these lovely little graphics, and this is a great example of the problems with Singapore. Downforce level, very high. PU load, very high, and that is mostly because of the heat, and we'll see, we saw tons of different uh, cooling uh, ducts and stuff show up, different louvres from each team that they brought, but brake wear, very high, and brake wear is what we saw today. Uh, this is Fernando Alonso. Uh, this is the funny little thing. Uh, he accidentally hit every single button on his wheel, and we'll see why here as he's coming up to this left-hander snap over steer will build 
and he actually hit the I'm coming into the pits button. Uh, and he basically said, oh, actually, I think there's a little caption here. He just said, push the push to pit uh, button. Is that on purpose? And he says, no, no. To avoid the crash with this car, I pushed all the buttons. <laughs> so he's basically mushed the steering wheel with his hand. And that's because you'll actually see when he comes up here, that curb right there. We saw Piastri. We saw Hamilton. Alonzo, Norris, uh, Magnuson, Hulkenberg, all of them hitting this curb. And last year, this wasn't such a big deal, uh, mostly because they hadn't really got these ground effect cars locked in this time last year. So they were still dealing with porpoising kind of stuff. And this is a very difficult track. So a lot of the ride height from a lot of different cars were very, very high. And we didn't really see them hitting this curb super hard. But this year, whoa, they got those ground effects locked down. Everybody is running super low to the ground. And I think really the Ferrari is the only one that I saw still having sort of that porpoising kind of issue in recent races. But as soon as he hits this, the car bottoms out and he almost loses it. And there were several drivers that did that. It was very, very close. Uh, we also saw braking front rights. If you want to look at one place we're locking up, this is, uh, I believe, just before the end of the course. There's a runoff area over here to your right. Uh, we saw um, Norris, Piastri, Sainz in this particular picture, Russell, uh, a whole bunch of people get this part of the track wrong and going on and it's uh, in sector three I believe and the front right just does not want to take it as soon as the load comes off of it It locks up hard and we saw tons of people complaining about braking issues And this is kind of a great example of that of him just going straight on uh, it is a pretty slow circuit So a lot of people you can see some of these marks here see the ones on the outside here where there's lots of rubber being laid down these are people that have gotten it wrong and there's some even coming across the the white rumble or the yellow rumble here uh there's, that's all the times people have gotten it wrong there they're that far out on the track so it's happening a lot and it's happening at this part of the circuit this is george russell into the uh wall just before the end of fp2 uh he is known for going into the wall around here he did it just up there at the end this is the same kind of part of the circuit here i think just after that other part and going into the wall there again he was able to slow it down by quite a bit just lost the inside front right uh, and i think the rear uh, right as well locked up you can see the uh the lines of tire rubber going in there and hit the wall the nose cone couldn't wouldn't come off which i thought was a bit odd usually when they change out nose cones they come off right away his wasn't so there might be some slight damage to the main plane where that uh, uh, connection goes on there there's not much that hold these front wings on they're very delicate uh, it is just two bolts on the top and two uh, they're like pins that come out that you slot in and that's what kind of holds the bottom pressure on and then there's a main one on the bottom where two uh, steel pieces uh, steel probably aluminum pieces hit each other so it's really not that much that holds those front wings on so usually it's a very easy so it could have either been those pins that were crumpled in or and this would be more detrimental if he damaged some of the uh, brakes and suspension system that sits right behind that uh, nose cone what else do we have here oh there yeah, this uh, the williams now this was middle of fp2 session this was before leclerc put his really fast time in the williams and the ferrari very very close so the williams this weekend i believe will be very fast surprised to see the Haas so slow because i thought their efficiency would push through even into such a uh, low speed circuit but it did not come to be we still have one more fp3 session tomorrow and qualifying again weather is going to be the biggest thing to watch out for we thought it was going to rain in the second session today didn't end up happening um fp3 is really in the front of the day which is going to be the closest one to rain but who knows it, you never know at singapore so that's basically the the tot up of fp1 and fp2 on friday pretty interesting to see lots of great uh, nighttime liveries although red bull did cancel theirs due to weight concerns which is if you look at this pretty concerning max verstappen down in 15th and sergio perez street course guy in eighth so, uh, but I don't think that's representative at all. I think uh, that car is just dog crap right now. And really, Singapore is all about balance, uh, making sure your car is predictable. Because if it's not, 
everybody's going to end up like uh, Russell, having some incidents. Uh, great to see. Subscribe if you're new. Throw me a like if you got a second, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for qualifying. <laughs>